I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Timmy Davis. Timmy Davis graduated from Birkbeck College with a master's in psychoanalytic studies. He also has a bachelor's in philosophy and religion from the University of Kent. Currently, he's a candidate at the site for contemporary psychoanalysis. His new article, New, Strange, Odd, and Weird Perceptions, A Lacanian Approach to Psychedelic Experience, can be found in the brand new issue of Lacunae, International Journal for Lacanian Psychoanalysis. That's issue 21. Mr. Davis is also part of the Psilocybin Rescheduling Project at the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group, which is running a campaign to move psilocybin from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2 to reduce unnecessary barriers to legitimate scientific and medical research. He's a contributing member of Drug Sciences Medical Psychedelics Working Group, as well as a guide on the psilocybin for treatment resistant depression trials at King's College, London. He also works as a welfare and harm reduction manager at music festivals in the UK and abroad. He recently co-authored a chapter entitled The Feminine in Shadowed, The Role of Psychedelics in Deconstructing the Gender Binary, for the book Psychedelic Mysteries of the Feminine, published in 2019. His forthcoming articles include Thou Art Not That Towards a Psychoanalytic Understanding of the Bad Trip and The Psychosis of St. Schreber. Mr. Davis is organizing and chairing a series of events on the intersection of psychoanalysis and psychedelics for the Maudsley Psychedelic Society. The first event is to be held on February 12th. Through this series, he hopes to initiate a conversation between contemporary psychoanalysis and psychedelic research, all proceeds going towards the Psychosis Therapy Project. Tickets for the first event can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Rendering Unconscious can be found on YouTube. Just visit Trapart Films YouTube channel. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T at YouTube. Or search for Rendering Unconscious podcast. There are only a few books left of Rendering Unconscious, the book. That's Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry, published by Trapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. I should probably say, um, well, how it is that I have ended up here, um, which is um, through applying, I, I sent in an abstract to the Das Unbehagen um, uh, conference um, when I saw it, saw it happening. Um, and that was like actually quite early on in my thought processes about psychoanalysis and psychedelics. Um, and so, I'd given a similar talk to what I submitted 
um, once before, maybe twice before. Um, and at that point, my thought was all around um, using Lacanian psychoanalysis um, and, you know, the ideas of Julia Kristeva to think about uh, bad trips specifically. Um, and now um, I have a master's under my belt and I've um, applied for a PhD and things like this. And my first psychoanalytic article is about to be uh, published in the Lacunae Journal. Um, and that was based on my uh, master's dissertation, um, which is called um, New, Strange, Odd and Weird Perceptions, a Lacanian Account of Psychedelic Experience. Um, and I'm very, very excited for that to come out because I haven't seen any other Lacanian account of psychedelic experience or, or really psychoanalytic one. Um, I mean, you can kind of uh, count Jungian ones, um, but of course the tension there, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's different. I feel like in academia, you know, the split between Freud and Jung really held and like Jungians are like off in their own world doing their own thing and talking to other Jungians. And then like Freudian, Lacanian and like other analysts kind of ended up more on the other side. Of course, they're all like divided up and only talk to their own schools as well. But I feel like the unions are really split off from the discourse from the kind of the rest of psychoanalysis. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting because I've been involved in the sort of like psychedelic research community for years, um, you know, probably like teens of years. And I, um, uh, like I said, I struggle to find anything on Freud or Lacan or Winnicott or Klein or anyone. Um, but Jung seems to be to be everywhere. Um, like, you know, there's there's some fantastic work that's been done on it. But you even get people um, like Professor David Nutt, who I don't know if you know about. He was um, the chair of the ACMD, the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs in the UK, an eminent um, neuropsychopharmacologist. And I heard him just a day or so ago um, saying how he thinks that some of the neuroscientific findings that they um, that they produced uh, through their imaging studies at Imperial College London actually verify um, Blake and Huxley as being correct. And of course, this is the whole Bogsonian sort of, um, you know, platonic forms kind of ideas um, and I just find this absolutely fascinating that um, even neuroscientists in the sector seem to um, be aligned with Jungian models is I find I find it bizarre I just think those two things were so juxtaposed but there we go <laughs> well what's happening in psychedelic research today for those who don't know because it's definitely having a resurgence I know here in Sweden I mean, there's whole groups that are doing uh, psychedelic therapies now and it's through like kind of the government's insurance and, you know, it's really taking hold. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, so, of course, there was the original sort of research into psychedelics in the 50s, um, you know, in in Canada and the States and some in the UK and a little bit dotted throughout Europe, which all got shut down, um, you know, because of socio-political reasons um, and the war on drugs and everything else. And since about the 90s, there's been little dribbles of research into psychedelics, um, some things with dimethyltryptamine and some things with uh, LSD in, in Switzerland. Um, but now, there's a few centers, both in the UK and the US, um, which have done both neuroimaging studies, but are also applying it as, this is both LSD and psilocybin, which is the magic, which is the active chemical in uh, magic mushrooms, um, are being applied as adjuncts to psychotherapy. Um, so it's actually showing really, really um, large effect sizes in, in quite small samples, but large effect sizes to treat uh, treatment resistant depression. So that's depression where uh, people have um, undergone two types of, um, you know, pharmaceutical therapies, 
um, you know, both of which are going to be SSRIs because, you know, the um, depression and pharmaceutical treatments is obviously a huge, interesting topic, but there have been no sort of real um, um, developments in the field with the exception of S-ketamine um, for about 30 years when SSRIs came in. So seeing psilocybin have these huge effect sizes um, and being ostensibly a brand new medicine is causing a whole lot of uh, interest, both from um, investors and academics and governments and, and all sorts of things, you know. Um, and I think that there are problems with the models that are being used in some of these research centers because um, psychedelics um, are, ha have been spoken about as um, producing hyper-suggestibility in the subject. And a lot of the treatment centers and the models that they're using based on these Jungian transpersonal models and things like this um, can seem to be kind of foisting certain metaphysical beliefs or you know uh, positions um on the subjects you know even having a sort of buddha statue in the room when people are dosing can be a real problem um you know ethically um it might actually turn out to be more effective with a buddha statue in the room but we haven't been able to do all that testing yet um and so that's why i think psychoanalysis is so well placed to be in conversation with psychedelic research because of course um you know arguably there's conversation around this too but freud's um split away from hypnosis and suggestion being this sort of foundational moment within psychoanalysis and and you know the free association free association technique and, and all the rest yeah exactly i mean that's why even though i appreciate and respect young and Jungians and everyone should practice how they feel is best. But that's why personally, even though I've read Jung and, and everything and appreciate his like kind of mythology and his archetypes and his ideas, I don't use it at all in clinical practice because, because of exactly that, because I don't want to suggest anything or any archetype or any ideas or put anything upon anyone. I'm much more aligned with the Freudian Lacanian idea where you only use the person's words back to them allow them to free associate and just kind of encourage their own free association and not bring any of your own ideas as the analyst into the room as much as possible. That's it. I, I mean, of course, you know, that, that question of um, as much as possible is absolutely fascinating to me, you know, um, because of course, of course, implicit in all our um, own associations and our own interpretations are going to mold it. The classic, you know, um, go to a Jungian, have Jungian dreams, uh, go to a Freudian, have Freudian dreams. Um, you know, surely it's the case you go to a um, Jungian and have Jungian trips, <laughs> or Freudian and have Freudian trips. But um, you do have people that have made sort of psychoanalytic models that incorporate both um Freud and Jung um you know there's um of course Stanislav Grof um and there's also people like um yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a classic um and uh there's also people that haven't spoken explicitly about psychedelics but do combine the sort of Freudian Jungian system in a similar way to to Grof um, like Joseph Campbell, for example, um, who I absolutely adore. Um, I, I think he's amazing and um, yeah, a lot, lot, lot to say about him and, and that. But it's this, um, this, this Groffian model that I find really interesting where there is a sort of personal unconscious, but then there are deeper layers of sort of more transpersonal um, levels, of, levels, levels of the unconscious. I don't necessarily uh, buy it. Um, you know, my, my thought at the moment um, is still in line with my uh, Lacanian paper, um, which kind of thinks about, um, you know, the, the 
the trip being a waking dream and all the things that are going on in dreams are happening in the same sort of way. Um, and, you know, in, in the interpretation of dreams, um, there's all these fascinating parts um, about the sort of um, effects of the outside world um, um, and also the internal physiological world upon the mental representations. And that's something that I kind of think about and, and play upon within the article. Um, yeah. Is that I the like one that's think, coming out in Lacunae? Yeah, yeah. New, strange, odd and weird perceptions, a Lacanian account of psychedelic experience. I, I took a long time to choose that title and I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. I look forward to that. Yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. So you, you read um, Realms of the Unconscious? Realms of the Human Unconscious? Yeah, I'm reading it now, actually. Before I even knew we were going to speak, I had decided to revisit Stanislav Graf because I read all of his work or a lot of his work when I was in my early 20s. Um, when I was getting my bachelor's degree in psychology. And originally, my dream was to go to CIIS, so the California Institute for Integral Studies, where he was teaching and get my degree as a psychologist there. Um, but then when it was time for me to apply for graduate school, he was like basically retiring, you know, and he like taught like one class, but he wasn't like a full professor there and like teaching and taking mentees and all of that anymore. So I decided instead to kind of stay, I'm from Miami, Florida originally. Um, so I decided to stay, you know, in my hometown and just go to graduate school there, get like a traditional uh, clinical psychology degree. And then um, there was no psychoanalysis in that school at all, except for like a few electives. There was like two analysts who had retired in Florida, basically from New York. <laughs> <laughs> who like taught some electives at our school. Um, so I took all their classes and they, and they were my mentors, my supervisors, thankfully. Thank goodness they were there um, because otherwise it was like a purely like CBT behavioral psychopharmacolo psychopharmacological model. Um, mm -hmm. And I would have only learned that. So I'm very grateful for them. Um, but yeah, since I wanted more psychoanalytic training, that's why when I moved to New York, I ended up uh, going to like formal psychoanalytic training there to get the real like Freudian couch model um, and then I could kind of figure out my own way after that but that was originally my dream was to go to CIS and work with Groff so <laughs> oh, <laughs> fun to revisit his work yeah I think they're, they're definitely doing um, a new a new training now in altered states and, and things um, I don't know if it's the same one, but I, I was under the impression that he's still teaching a little bit there now, or or is again, or something like this. I don't know. Yeah, he's still around, and he still does his holotropic breathwork um, courses. I think that's what he was transitioning more towards doing was like traveling and doing the holotrop holotropic breathwork um, for a while. Plus, he's getting on a bit now as well. I think. Yeah, I must be in his eight eighties. Yeah, it's it's one of those things like because of Zoom and everything. Obviously, it's a bit easier to sort of have people involved in events when they're maybe a bit older or a bit more distant. And um, one of the things that I've been working on recently is a series of events around psychoanalysis and psychedelics, um, which I've organised for the Maudsley Psychedelic Society, <clears throat> and. The Maudsley Psychedelic Society are um, uh, sort of the public facing arm of the psychedelic trials group at King's College London, who are doing lots of these psilocybin for treatment depression trials. Um, and yeah, I really have in mind that I would love to have Stanislav Groff come along to one of them at some point. Um, at the moment it's three events but it might carry on into a few more um, and of course actually it's, it's slim pickings like people that are interested in psycho not necessarily interested but sort of um, vocally um, admitting uh, that they are interested in this thing and um, that are uh, writing about it um, and putting themselves out there but of course he's the He's the, yeah, the godfather, the, the granddaddy. 
Yeah, and that's exactly what he talks about in this in this book. His first book was that uh, you know, in in Prague he was able to practice, he was getting the LSD through the pharmaceutical companies, like through the government, government trials. And it was like very controlled and through medical doctors. And then he came to the US and, you know, there's all this like moral judgment around it and this like mania and hysteria. And um, he said it was just like a completely different world than like where he had come from and studying it uh, through his research. And of course, it's really a shame that the U.S. did that, but that's the U.S. loves to do things. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's coming back. It's coming back. It's fine. And, you know, they're um, uh, leading the way, really. I mean, of course, there's lots of different sort of angles on this, but um, there's some incredible work coming out of, out of the U.S. in, in psychedelic science. And one, one of the best things about this particular um area of research is that every new paper is groundbreaking pretty much uh, because it's just not been done before you know the, the trials and things that were done in um you know the 50s 60s and 70s um were, were great and interesting but they're just not that rigorous um and a lot of them have been sort of uh um you know repeated and not found the same results and, and things like that and it's a big issue with psychedelic science, actually, um, the the sort of, um, you know, interest and, and hype and uh, expectation and hope um, being things that are both conscious and unconscious in the researchers will go on to affect um, the results that they're getting from uh, the participants in the trials, um, which, again, is a, another reason to think about the transference like you know really really go heavy on the transference in in theorizing these states and and these things you know maybe and you hear people say it actually sometimes that um maybe um they wanted to get better um not to let down the researcher um and things like this so um yeah it's it's fascinating and, and the work in psychoanalysis and psychedelics really needs to be done um, I find being um, at this intersection um, often quite sort of lonely and isolating um, because a lot of the times when you speak to um, psychoanalysts, you have to explain uh, what psychedelics are and why they shouldn't be afraid of them and, and things like this and sort of start from the ground up in that way. Um, and of course, the same thing is true when you speak at a psychedelic conference um, you have to be like this is the reason that I'm thinking about Freud and Lacan and all these things and um, you know no it's not just a sort of you know um, you know patriarchal colonialist uh, you know homophobic you know all, all these things that have ever been thrown at the psychoanalysis um, thing um, and so I'm really hoping that this um, series of events um, for the Maudsley Society um, will begin that conversation in a more serious way. Um, so that, yeah, not least I'm, I'm <laughs> surrounded by people that I can speak to about, <laughs> speak about it too, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the first event is on February 12th. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who's there and what's going to happen? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, February 12th um, is uh, a live panel Q&A discussion um, over Zoom, um, which I'll be chairing. And uh, the three people that I'll be joined by, by are uh, Andrew Feldmar, who is a psychoanalyst practicing in Vancouver. Um, he trained with um, R.D. Lang in LSD psychotherapy in 1974-1975 in London um, and has been a vocal proponent of um, you know psychedelic uh, adjuncts to psychotherapy and that's really his angle that psychedelics um, should be an adjunct to ongoing psychotherapy rather than the sort of um, centerpiece or you know the, the 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 main event to which um psychotherapy is an accoutrement it, it's the other way around um you know, the the psilocybin or the lsd or whatever it may be 
facilitates the process um, by exacerbating the transference and, and things like this. Um, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and then we've got Professor uh, Nathan Gorlick, who um, is at the University of Utah, and he's an English professor. And he's going to be, he also trained um, with uh, GIF RIC in Quebec. Um, and he will be speaking on the, the reason why um, psychedelic clinicians should be reading literature, um, specifically um, Vallis uh, by Philip K. Dick. And his sort of idea is that through this novel, um, Philip K. Dick um, uh, kind of puts forward a personal um, semi-autobiographical narrative of um, his experience of uh, madness and an altered state and, and things like this, sometimes drug induced and that um, through uh, reading this, we can see the similarities and the differences and really sort of enter into those kind of spaces um, and tease apart um, what we might mean by a psychedelic experience and what we might mean by a psychotic experience and, and things like this. Um, then we have um, Paul Zeal. Paul Zeal also trained uh, with R.D. Lang um, at Kingsley Hall, which was one of R.D. Lang's um, sort of experimental communities where doctors and, and patients would um, live on sort of equal playing, playing field on a, on, a, on a level with each other. And he'll be reading some of his personal diaries and journals from the time that he was there with R.D. Lang um, that include some of his own personal accounts of, of um, psychedelic experiences, but also seeing Lang work with patients with LSD. Um, Paul Zeal has been a practicing psychoanalyst for a few decades now and will be sort of reflecting um, with, uh, with hindsight upon those experiences. His talk is called Psychedelics and the Eye. Um, so that's going to be interesting. The, the three talks of this first event um, are going to be released uh, over the next couple of days, pre-recorded, so that people in different time zones and you know everybody's got different, um, you know, different schedules and things will be able to watch them and send in their questions or prepare their questions um, before the panel event. And so hopefully we'll be able to sort of yeah sift through and 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 find some find some zingers for the for the speakers. Oh, cool. So people can listen to the lectures before the 12th on their own time when they have time. And then on the 12th, you all get together as a panel and have a discussion. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's fantastic. What an interesting way to put the event together. Yeah, it, it was um, kind of um, inspired by another conference that I'm taking part in called um, uh, Psychedelics, Madness and Awakenings. Um, and they're very, very conscious of um, increasing accessibility. So the talks are spaced out. This conference takes place over, you know, like I think like four months. And every Saturday there's a series of talks released that are pre-recorded and that have, um, you know, sign language. They have um, subtitles, uh, and then also. Um, there's a series of panels as well so that people can really take their time over these things and and get involved however they like um, and they're being they're being really good about it it's probably the singular most ethical um, you know conference format that I've that I've come across so they've really put in a lot of work and they've done really well being very conscious of them um, people with lived experience and, and things like this being represented within the conference as well, which I think is important. I'd say more about that. Yeah, they're, they're, they're really cool. They're really, really cool. Um, it was set up um, in part by a friend of mine, uh, Tessine Narani, who works with the Hearing Voices Network. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's kind of around, this idea of um, well, 
psychedelics um, traditionally within the literature are contraindicated um, for family history of psychosis um, or, or, you know, um, active psychosis too, um, and personality disorders as well. And their kind of argument um, or reflections on this are that there's a whole lot of people that are getting uh, left out of this. Um, if psychedelics really do become a, you know, revolutionary treatment for the neuroses, um, what happens to, to those who um, do not fall within that category? Um, which is one of the reasons that also um, the proceeds from the events that I'm setting up will be going to the Psychosis Therapy Project here in London, um, which is a service that provides um, low-cost, long-term psychoanalytic talk therapy um, and, and supervision for trainees and things like this in, in the uh, treatment of the psychoses. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, even in that way, people say that psychoanalysis isn't good for people that have psychosis, but I don't, I haven't found that to be the case at all. It's like, at least when I was in training, they made it out like psychoanalysis is so dangerous and you have to be so careful. And like, if you're not putting your ideas on someone and you really are just um, like reflecting back to them and using their associations, I don't really see how that's possible. I mean, I found like when I worked like in hospital settings with people who were having more like uh, current psych psychotic episodes where they were really feeling fragmented or having a hard time kind of grounding, you know, then I, then I had a supervisor that just taught us like, instead of, uh, he was trained as an analyst, but he worked, he didn't work as an analyst. He worked in hospital settings and he just said, you know, well, you know, if somebody's feeling more like floridly psychotic or like they're having a hard time kind of being in present reality, um, instead of like letting them go into their dreams as much if, they, if they're kind of going in, in a circle or like getting kind of far out there, then just try to hap ask them, like, instead of asking about like your dreams, say like, well, how did you sleep? Like, what was the room like? What was the temperature like? And just kind of help them get more into like the physical space or their physical body. And I found when I did that, that always seemed to work really well, just like helping them ground more like in the material reality instead of get in, into their mind so much. So just kind of being aware of that and like changing a little bit what I was asking about seemed to help a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that kind of idea of, um, I know it's really quite a simplistic one, but the sort of just the place of the ego within, you know, psychosis and neurosis and sort of boundedness and and proximity and, and distance and, and that kind of thing I think is absolutely fascinating it's why you know even, even words like that you don't really hear in in any other um you know any other discipline uh, but can be so useful thinking psychologically I, I think yeah. yeah I want I wish they would teach more psychoanalytically or psychologically minded theories like starting in grade school <laughs> So yeah. just, like just like a general class like they do with history and literature and everything I wish it would be kind of more integrated because I feel like um, even just the basic knowledge or basic kind of even just seeing different perspectives you know not even like one understanding but like what different psychologists have said and helping people to like see these different points of view would help us a lot because I feel like so many people are re just reacting um, to stimuli without really having that space to think about and choose how they want to act. And I feel like a lot of kind of conflicts could be mitigated a bit if people just didn't feel so reactionary all the time. And so yeah. just transfer in the transference all the time. We, we have, um, you know, in the UK, we have A-levels um, in sort of like high school. And one of the A-levels that you can take at some places, um, you can take a psychology one and, um, you know, they go through um, very basic, uh, you know, behavioralist, cognitive and... Um, Skinner and Pavlov and... Yeah, and, um, <laughs> you know, a little bit of Freud, but Freud is always just psychosexual stages, you know, that's, that's it. <laughs> I don't even really talk about repression or you know, the most basic thing, um, which is frustrating. Um, I've been quite lucky that there's been 
dribs and drabs of um, psychoanalytic teaching at, at my, um, I, I did philosophy and religion at undergrad. And there was a um, wonderful teacher doing a, a single module, um, very, very short modules too. Um, but the, the reading the, on, on psychoanalysis um, and the reading list was extensive um, and it was, it was really good. I, I thought it was amazing. Um, I've totally lost her name though, um, but it might come back to me. Um, but she's a, yeah, a, a well, well read of course, but um, uh, lots of publications. She's a um, feminist theorist too. Uh, I'll, I'll remember at some point. <laughs> That's okay, but it's, it's, it's great that just one person can really make a difference and like turn you on to these kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I also wanted to um, uh, start um, analysis with her, um, but she was already retired at the time that I met her, unfortunately. Um, so I had to wait a few more years. Yeah, not that I would have been able to afford the analysis on my student loan. <laughs> but, that's, that's always a bit of an issue. <laughs> How did you end up in psychoanalysis more thoroughly? Well, I think that really my sort of psychoanalytic, um, like initial psychoanalytic awakening was um, probably uh, the Pervert's Guide to Ideology um, and the Pervert's Guide to Cinema. Like, you know, I was just watching loads of films at the time, came across them and then was like, wow. Um, and it was when I started um, uh, experimenting with psychedelics when I was very, you know, in, in my teens, really. Uh, it was a bit irresponsible, but um, it kind of made me think a lot about language and the construction of reality uh, and mind. Um, and then I remember sort of <laughs> pirating a copy of... Um, uh, a Cree <laughs> and just trying to read a Cree like in my sort of mid-teens and being like I have no idea what's going on but I know that this is something that I will find interesting at some point in the future um, and then from there I kind of you know just started reading dribs and drabs of Freud and was lucky enough to have this module at my university and and things like that um, also one of my uh, other module leaders um, was a uh, gentleman named David Caulfield, um, who co-authored um, Why Do People Get Ill with Darian Leader. So that was another sort of like, you know, kept this kind of psychoanalytic thing very much in, in my mind. Um, then I went to a talk on, you know, radical cultures, I think it was called like, or, or radical mental health, DIY cultures or something like this. There's a gentleman there um, talking about Franz Fanon. Um, and I suddenly sort of realized, wow, like psychoanalysis is not just psychoanalysis as I'm thinking about it. It's something much bigger. Um, it's something extremely powerful and, and very useful. You know, he, he said something around, um, around the kind of idea, um, you know, psychoanalysis isn't just about um, the inside of the infant individual. Um, it's also, you know, the, the socioeconomic, the group, uh, the political, um, and yeah, it just sort of opened, opened my mind and opened up my ideas in, in a big way. Um, and so, yeah, I just sort of like went full steam ahead, um, did a master's uh, in psychoanalysis, um, all the time with this, this thread of, um, psychedelics and and how the two could communicate um you know googling all the time to find if anybody had written on it um, and it just wasn't there so um th that gentleman that spoke on Franz Fanon actually ended up being my first analyst um his, ne his name is Paul Gurney uh and then I went on to um find another analyst uh, slightly later on and join the site for contemporary psychoanalysis where I'm now training. Um, and I've only been training there for quite a short time. Um, you know, we're in our uh, like second term um, and it's been fantastic. It's, you know, I, I think a lot of um, 
psychoanalytic trainings uh, can be relatively narrow, um, but they're, they're steeped in philosophy. Um, they're very self-reflective. Um, yeah, I've got some positive transfers to that, uh, to that institution. <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. That's great. Really, yeah. And so you said it's been all the time remotely so far because it's all been during the pandemic. Yeah, which has been bizarre, absolutely bizarre. Um, and, you know, brings up all these questions of, well, what are the best ways to, you know, see clients? Like, what is the new orthodoxy? Um, you know, is, is, you know, with with the, the disembodied voice of the of the telephone, is that going to be right for all clients? Um, you know, uh, is it going to be potentially damaging? Is it more important just to make sure that that it's happening? I know lots of people are now seeing clients by going on walks and and things like that as well. Um, and they're all things I want to experiment with, but yeah, particularly uh, zeitgeist um, that it's all it's all remote. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's kind of more old school. I mean, analysts used to do things like that, like go on walks or go on a, in a park or something like that. Um, yeah. So maybe it's kind of broken out of the box of like the orthodoxy of like the frame of the room and just made more possibilities possible. And so analysts could like work in different ways of maybe just find what works best for them or their different analysis or you know, different situations. Like right now we don't really have a choice. So we'll see we'll see what happens in the future I'm, I'm sort of getting into the ideas of like uh Mikhail Borg Jakobsen and and um you know Francois Rustang and and um that kind of that kind of bunch and um you know this idea of uh the the sort of altered the, the light altered state of consciousness um that analysis is or or can precipitate and of course, thinking about psychedelics and meditation and, and these kind of altered states and, and things that I'm interested in. Um, when I think about um, technology mediated or, or activity mediated analysis, um, you know, as in just different from the, from the room itself, um, I think, well, of course, there's no reason why these light altered states and sort of like joint trance uh, states that the and that the analysis um, produces can't be precipitated during a walk. You know, um, like you know, how many times have you found yourself walking in nature and you know lost track of time or or found yourself thinking in a new way or had a new memory come up that you've not thought about um, and yeah, it's, it's interesting, and especially with Zoom being very face-to-face. -face. Um, I know some people still practice psychoanalysis or do practice psychoanalysis face-to-face, -face, um, you know, in, in the room. Um, and some people prefer that, and some clients prefer that. Sometimes it's need and necessity and things like this. But of course, traditionally, um, there's, there's not much face-to-face -face contact there's somebody lying down and you know staring at whatever picture you put up in front of the couch um and there's the analyst who is also looking away and you know entering those reveries um that sort of being so uh exposed to the gaze on zoom um can sometimes get in the way of i think um you know we we require a little bit of a bit of distance and and break from each other to be able to really free associate and and move in states of consciousness that aren't necessarily um goal oriented um and, and focused and you know what is it the, the classic thing that that freud said um uh free floating attention kind of thing you know yeah exactly um no, I mean, the face to face just keeps you in the imaginary. That's how that's how I explain to people when they like first come in of the difference between like using the couch or now just like turning the visual off and just having the voice uh, versus face to face is that, you know, even if you're not consciously doing it, you're con 
constantly looking for social cues and how is this person reacting to what I'm saying and you know do they think it's funny am I being charming do they think I'm weird you know all, are they upset with me you know all these different things and we're constantly like looking at that and thinking about that you know unconsciously and maybe consciously too um, and that keeps people from being able to just like go more into themselves and I try to explain to people like this is this time is all about you and you don't need to be worrying about me as much as possible <laughs> um, and it's better for you to just be able to like go into your own mind and really focus on yourself um, and not like worry about how I'm reacting to you you know all the time and most people understand that mm -hmm. it's uh, an interesting thing within um you know psychedelic assisted psychotherapy too because historically you've got two different strands of it you've got psychedelic which is these sort of high dose sort of maybe even trying to induce the sort of uh, characteristic mystical experience um, uh, and then there's psycholytic um, which is slightly lower doses um, but repeated um, the idea being that the lower doses sort of lower defenses um, and increased associations and you know more primary process uh, entering consciousness that kind of thing that can then be you know um, worked through and, and and thought about um and the way that pretty much and I, I think this has got to do with people who are funding the studies and obviously looking for their their products um being the psychedelics being cost effective and, and reaching market authorization so that they can be rolled out and a profit can be turned and, and all the rest are focusing on this psychedelic way of doing psychedelic therapy these, these high dose single dose things where as little sort of contact time um can be there as possible with the with the biggest um effect size um and so when they're doing this they they want the person to be sort of really going into the heart of you know the, the the heart of what it is that they might be looking for it's like a lot of models are about um sort of like diving deep into the into the depths and finding the scary cave and going inside it and opening up the clam and finding the pearl and bringing it back up to the surface and this is a model that's used um, and has been been published and spoken about called the ace model um and to do that they keep um the person looking inwards as much as possible through the use of eye shades and also a sort of pre-selected playlist um and i i think that this is this is interesting for like a number of reasons um but <laughs> one of the reasons that i come on to it is because more naturalistically um when people in, in the uk you have psilocybin mushrooms growing growing wild in fields for a few months of the year and people take them and you know they find that they pick them they walk around and they're they're in nature and so they have a lot of sort of like nature connectedness um and they can find this really useful and it's you know they're not necessarily going into these sort of like deep personal traumatic places and, and working through them it's a more outward looking perspective where they're connecting with the world and they're yeah it's a it's it's just an interesting sort of um uh difference in in models that i i hope to see more of um you know rather than people being told to look inwards and and to do these really high doses to connect with the darker places of themselves um, you know why not this more sort of um i think there's got to be a sweet spot a sort of like uh elan vital kind of delusion bergsonian kind of trajectory um with psychedelics but also with the distance from the platonic forms and um sort of religious dogmas that are implicit within ideas about mystical experience and, and things like that but it's a very difficult line to tread to to get these things right and so yeah hopefully lots of people are going to start thinking about this <laughs> yeah well that's a, that's a good point too because that's also like like how you talked about before how freud broke away from this like 
hypnosis model and suggestion model. It's like, instead of, you know, and he, he found that it was better to see people more often and let them go into this kind of light altered state not more naturally just by laying down and looking away. And then they were able to access things kind of on their own terms instead of like forcing them to access something traumatic like on the spot, which could mm -hmm. bring it up and could be more detrimental or upsetting, you know, but let them work through it like in a slower way. So maybe like doing like lower doses or micro dosing or something um, more often, or like you said, being out in nature where people feel more connected to the world and the earth and see the earth. I think something I would love to see is people start thinking about the earth as a living thing again, <laughs> because like everything's alive, everything has energy, like seeing, you know, the, the trees breathing and that sort of experience and feeling like you're connected and part of this bigger whole, um, you know, might make people stop like basically raping the earth and like taking all the resources out and thinking of it as just something to use um, to make money or whatever and thinking of it more of like as a being that we need to work with instead of yeah being so abusive to to it you know and to each other start realizing like people are very connected the earth is connected we're all on this planet together have a more like societal view or overview rather than being so like just me 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 yeah absolutely i don't know if you've seen um or or heard of um hamilton's pharmacopoeia do you know this this show it's really good it's like a vice production um there's a psychopharmacologist chemist guy called um hamilton morris and he's kind of like quite tall and nerdy but like super smart and like just just quite a cool guy and he um sort of does all this research into a specific substance and how it is used in different places and the, and the chemistry of it and whether it can be um uh sort of synthetically made and things like this and he's got three series of this now and in the most recent series there's an episode where he talks about um bufo alvarius which is uh the sonoran uh, desert toad and this this toad um has sort of sacs on its neck that you can milk uh, and scrape the stuff that comes out uh, dry it out and and vaporize it and when you vaporize um and inhale this um this <laughs> a frog venom um you have uh, a sort of clear light mystical experience um it's called 5-MeO-DMT is the chemical name of this substance most people lots of people have heard of DMT which is NMDMT which is kind of visual sort of tessellating fractals quite often and contact with entities and and things like this but 5-MeO-DMT is very much more sort of clear light it's very interesting um, but the reason that I bring this up is because he goes to a conference um, that's all about this toad and the experience precipitated by this, this venom. And all the people there are very sort of, um, you know, pro-ecological activism and, and this kind of thing. Um, but they're all going to the desert and stealing these toads um, and the lights on their cars are drawing the toads into the road and they're running them over and you know the the numbers of native wild toads of this particular type in this particular area um where is the only place that they're found are diminishing uh, rapidly um and he goes on stage and he says look you know uh you can synthesize this chemical and it will do the exact same thing you just gotta have like you know these these other chemicals and you know, then no toads are harmed, no toads are captured, you know, all, all this kind of thing. And all the people there are like, no, no, no. Uh, it's the it's the spirit of the toad. It's uh, connecting with the earth and um, the toad through doing this thing and put themselves in this strange paradox of like, you know, um, in order to understand that you need to protect the earth, you've got to do this thing that is damaging to one of the beautiful biodiverse aspects of it. Um, That's giving you that experience. This is what people do. This is the problem with people. We do this with everything. It like, doesn't matter what kind of idea we come up with or like solution to something, then it beco becomes this whole other problem. It's like, no matter what we do, this is what happens. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. <laughs> um, 
But I just feel bad for these toads. Like, you know, they're just trying <laughs> to be toads. Live their lives. Live their toad lives. <laughs> but they no, got people real. coming along and smoking their venom. <laughs> I know. We do this to everything. It's like yeah. individual people, but like when we're in groups, it just becomes a disaster. And of course, we all have to live in groups. So here we are. <laughs> we'll see what happens next but I, I don't know if you know this analyst named Ingo Lambrecht um he he's in New Zealand and he works with the Maori there and um he's written a wonderful he's originally South African and he was um initiated with by Sangomas so he's a Sangoma and then he moved to New Zealand um, is a psychologist and psychoanalyst and he works in a clinic there that specifically work with Maori people and um, you know make sure to to not work in this like western medicalized view and like you know be respectful of their worldview and the culture um, in their treatment and he's fantastic and he and I wrote a paper together that was talking about um, psychoanalytic and ritual states as like transitional spaces, kind of looking at like the Winnicottian idea of the transitional space and then talking about how these kinds of ritualistic and alternative um, uh, mental states uh, are similar to like the psychoanalytic kind of space as well. So you would probably like that paper. I can send you a link. I don't, I don't know where it is, but I, I think the book that it's in was just republished. It was out of print. Yeah, but it was just republished like two weeks ago. So it, it should be on Amazon. I'll send you the link. So you probably yeah, that like that really and you probably like his work. That sounds really, really good. Um, I got um, turned on to a person recently uh, who's also from New Zealand, I think, who I think his name's Graham Bull. Um, and uh, he writes about, he, he uses... Lacanian psychoanalysis to think about uh, Qigong um, and I haven't gone too far into it yet but I, I'm just quite amazed um, by I've, I've come across a, another woman too who um, is writing her PhD she's a, she's an ex um, uh, barrister from India I believe uh, and now is doing a PhD um, thinking about um, uh, energy work through a Lacanian, you know, lens. I'm just like, wow. <laughs> Good. Well, I, and I'm I, hoping, like you said, like it's like been not acceptable, but I think that's been this very kind of Western narrow medical model, like monoculture, white worldview or whatever that's been implemented on everyone, like forced down everyone's throat. But really, you know, like every culture for all of human history has had some sort of work with psychedelics at some point because it, psychedelic substances exist all over the world in different forms and you know it's it's a part of human culture and human history and the way that we work with our consciousness so I think that it's kind of demonization has been like really unfortunate and um, yeah it seems like people are trying to move away from that very narrow point of view and and look at history and culture and different cultures and uh, reintegrate these aspects of ourselves that have been like cut off and kind of demonized over time yeah absolutely i mean it's it's quite fascinating because you've got as you said these sort of indigenous cultures that have their own sort of historic use and some of these cultures still um still survive and still practice and, and things like this within the parameters the law of their places that you know are now governed by um yeah the the colonial powers and, and things like this um and i find it really fascinating because so many people within psychedelic research are saying oh well there's so much that we can learn from from these indigenous cultures on how best to use these sacraments because you know of course for some people they're religious sacraments we shouldn't just medicalize these things too um you know they can be any number of things um defined by the expectations and the intentions of the people using them they're, they're culturally mediated fundamentally these these states and, and these substances um but um yeah, the thing that I find fascinating is that creating these psychotherapy, psychotherapeutic protocols um, and thinking about how we can implement them 
within the West and how they can be regulated and how they can be held and contained and um, applied and, and things like this. We're actually um, in the process of um, creating our own Western tradition of psychedelic use, um, you know, or, or modern Western, or um, especially in Great Britain. While we have these liberty caps, uh, we call them, you know, they're little pointy like nipple mushrooms that <laughs> grow in this, uh, grow for a couple of months here in, in uh, September-ish. Um, really, even Gordon Wasson, who first sort of uh, was the first Westerner to try psilocybin mushrooms in Mexico and then publicize it, um, called uh, Great Britain in the UK, um, uh, what was it, mycophobic culture. Um, because while we've got all these psychedelic mushrooms everywhere, um, all the literature in the UK um, shows how wild mushrooms were just thought to be intrinsically dangerous um, and, and poisonous and harmful. And so people would leave them well alone. Um, so here people will say, oh, well, the, the druids and, and the witches and, and these kind of things. But there's very little evidence that there's been any indigenous um, psychedelic, um, you know, ritualistic or, or otherwise um, consumption and practice with, with psychedelics in the UK. So we really are starting from scratch here. Like this is our first sort of, um, yeah, this is our, this is our creation of, of tradition and, and culture with, with mysticism at the heart of it. It's quite fascinating um, time, in, time in history. Do you want to stop with that? Did you have anything else that you wanted to talk about? Um, maybe I could just say um, the, these substances are extremely promising, um, but uh, researchers face huge hurdles um, to, and, and barriers to being able to, to study them. Uh, because of their schedule one status in the UK and at the UN level um, and in, in many jurisdictions and I implore anybody that's listening um, both to sort of educate yourselves on on the modern research into these things but also to um, if you're in the UK write to your MP or you know just think generally about how you can get involved in reducing barriers to research so that we can increase our knowledge of these things. We can increase access. We can reduce suffering, hopefully. Um, and yeah, just ho hopefully this conversation, the paper and the events upcoming will start a conversation around these things and um, reduce some stigma and increase access. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So the, the next, the first event is on February 12th mm -hmm. and I've already signed up. So I will see you there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Timmy Davis. For more, join him at the first event inaugurating a series on psychoanalysis and psychedelics, February 12th. Tickets can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and poetry from Chapart Books 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T R A P A R T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com forward slash. V-A-N-E-S-S-A 2-3-C-A-R-L Your support is greatly appreciated. For more information, you can also visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net 
or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.org. Blood or Hunter's Moon, the emphasis breaking, probably changed my everything, has its reproduction and reduction, he and we, universe of creation, but there is a connection and a sympathy, those both we Spirit is best sought only when no other was at the front. The contrary, he disturbed in his soul. Hurricane of force is what attracts. Here I wish to make more use of the positive power knowledge relations. But seriously, everything good? I am an occupant. I am special object, objective, or path, in a spurn, essay, how are you, by another day in the experience. I heard there were 12 gods of fellow artists. That's how the story was told to, which produce at its most, is lived by those things will won a bunch of awards is creation the analysis to it and to the gems and no matter what is happening in my there is here a stirring of the value and organ of the child is more real experience is consume and give light of the possessed has been burned try to kill me then I'm okay with that as signified by the intense experience mysterious and her influences and have as many more information in this matter propagating the remain queen in posterior supremacy it in composing verbal of right ingredient they to respond to provided not only the such we not fully evening of leisure but should her interest compel and detached awareness or listening i find that nor not the train and I thought of you and I time will tell movement act firework going off in front of me benefit attack being summary a message for as the mountains El Ea emerged to be me and words that make up the fictional self, the unauthorized.